All right. We are going to be talking through Concept 1, Notes for Honor Students, which is about the nature of science and the scientific method. First, I love this quote from the National Academy of Sciences because I think it does a really perfect job just kind of summarizing what the nature of science really is. And it says, science is a particular way of knowing about the world. In science, explanations are limited to those based on observations and experiments that can be substantiated by other scientists. Explanation that cannot be based on empirical evidence are not part of science. And I love this because it really puts the emphasis on experimentation. And experimentation is based on the scientific method. And so that's why what we're talking about in this is so important for what we'll be learning the rest of the year. First, there's several different types of scientific knowledge. And so I really want to make sure you know the difference between these words as an honor student. So first is a fact. A fact is an objective and verifiable observation. Example, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. This is a fact because it's not an opinion. It's verifiable, meaning that someone could replicate and determine this over and over again um, to prove that it is true. A principle is a little different. It is a statement based on repeated experimental observation that describes an aspect of the world. So for an example, the greenhouse effect. So, you know, lots of repeated experimental observations have been made and we have this principle of the greenhouse effect that kind of describes how the temperature of the earth is the way that it is um, in terms of gases being held in to keep the earth at a certain temperature, which we'll talk more in our ecology unit. So a slight distinction from a fact, um, a principle, it's just a little bit different and it's more of a descriptive um, thing rather than a statement. Now, a law and a theory are very important to distinguish between. Laws are broad concepts or principles when I, that explain how. So when I think law, it's a three-letter word that ends in W and how ends in W. So I think laws explain how or describe how something occurs. So we're describing how patterns in nature exist. We often accept them as facts in the scientific world. Um, that's just how it is. But examples are Newton's laws of motion or Boyle's gas laws or the law of conservation of mass. These are all description of patterns that we've repeatedly seen in nature that explain how things happen, how things move, how gases interact, that kind of thing. Now, a theory in science is very important that you understand the difference between the scientific definition of a theory and just the English definition of a theory. Because I find that in English classes, people tend to think theories are just, you know, ideas or guesses about something. But in science, they hold a lot more weight. Um, a theory is an explanation of observed phenomena. It is organized facts and research from scientists that explain why. So theory ends in why and why ends with why. And that's how I kind of distinguish. So a law is how a theory explains why. Theories can never become a law or a fact. I think a lot of people think once a theory becomes more advanced, it graduates into being a law, but that's not true. They're different things. Laws explain how, again, theories explain why. Example is the theory of evolution. This is an explanation of observed phenomena. It is based on facts and research from scientists to explain why things change over time. Now, again, to emphasize, science is based on experimentation. All of those things we just talked about, those types of scientific knowledge, are based on experimentation. And the development of an experiment follows a scientific method, which you're probably very familiar with as an honor student from previous science classes. So we're asking a question, conducting background research, constructing a hypothesis, testing our hypothesis in an experiment, analyzing the data, and then drawing conclusions and communicate them. So I'm pretty aware, sure that you're aware of the scientific method. So what we're really going to be hitting in these notes is how the scientific method applies to writing a formal lab report which is a skill an honor student will be expected to do. So we're going to take these six steps and kind of break them down into smaller sections that would be gone through in terms of doing the formal lab report. So first, asking a question. First, to get going on just designing an experiment and writing a lab report on it, we have to ask a question, and these questions are based on observations. So we need to know what an observation is. An observation is a description of something you can see, smell, touch, taste, and hear. It is not an opinion. It has to be an objective. 
meaning anyone could walk in and make the same observation. So an example is you could observe that the ground is wet. An inference, on the other hand, is a guess about an object or outcome based on your observations. You can make inferences, many of them, from just one observation and because they're subjective. You're guessing what you think. So examples, we could observe that the ground is wet and then we could infer that it rained or that someone was watering the plants or maybe that someone spilled something. So those are all guesses, inferences about why the ground could be wet. So it's important to know those distinctions. So I want you to take a second and make some observations about this photo and some inferences. So just pause the video and do that for a second. Now, examples, hopefully you've written some down. Observations are that there are five people, that one of the people is wearing purple shorts, that there are cars parked in the background, those kinds of things. Inferences could be that this picture is from the 90s because of the datedness of their clothes, that this child came from some Star Wars event based on their shirt and lightsaber, um, that these children don't know this child just based on the way that they're looking at them, that this child's oblivious. You know, there's, those are just all different inferences you can make or guesses about this um, interesting photo. So making note, observations are either qualitative or quantitative. So qualitative observations describe qualities. Um, examples are green liquid, large hole, sour taste, sweet smell. You know, we're just describing things with words. Quantitative observations use numbers to measure something. So four feet long, six legs, 7.2 grams, 100 milliliters. And I remember the difference between these because qualitative has an L. When I see that L, I think of letters or words to describe something. Whereas quantitative has that N. So when I see that N, I think of using numbers to, to describe something. Let's try that with this picture. So this little collage, I want you to pause. I want you to write qualitative observations, quantitative observations, and inferences. So a qualitative observation could be that there are missing pieces of the cookie. You know, a quantitative observation could be she's eating one cookie, or I think there's 21 cookies on the left. An inference could be that she took a bite out of each cookie or that she has a mischievous face based on this little face that she's making. Those are all examples. Now, your quantitative data needs to be two things. It needs to be both precise and accurate. So precise means how close your measurements are to each other. They should be consistent or specific. You, know, you should consistently be getting the same measurements if you're measuring something over and over to be precise. And your measurements should also always be specific. We want them to be as specific as possible. And then accurate means we obviously want them to be correct. We want them to be right or close to the accepted value. So if a person is known to be five feet, five inches tall, when you measure them, we want you to get really close to five feet, five inches, because then your measurement would be considered accurate. When you are measuring an instrument, using some sort of measurement tool, you want to use the most specific reading that you can see and then you want to estimate one more decimal place. Um, and we'll practice this with some measurement stations in a little bit in class. But I want to look, I love this picture because I think it does a good job showing the difference between precise and accurate. So using a bullseye, if you're throwing darts or shooting a bow and arrow, the most correct or accurate place to hit is the center. So looking at this first picture, this person has thrown four darts and they're consistently hitting the center which is both accurate and correct. So they're both, they're both precise, they're consistent, and then they're accurate because they're correctly hitting the right spot. This person is consistent, but they're not correct. So they would be precise, but not accurate. Right here, this person is kind of accurate. You know, they're really, really close to the, the bullseye, but they're not consistent. They're not always hitting the same spots. We would say they're accurate, but not precise. And then this person over here is not near the bullseye and they're not consistent. So they're not precise and they're not accurate. After you've asked a question, you're going to conduct background research and from there you'll define a purpose and objective. So the goal of all scientific investigations is to answer some sort of question. And so we're going to make some observations, which is going to cause us to ask questions, which is going to cause us to do some research to figure out what's already been found. And then last, from there, we'll define a clear purpose for our investigation. 
That purpose or objective is a statement that's going to clearly show what question you're trying to answer in your investigation. From there, you can construct a hypothesis, which is way more than an educated guess. So do not say that in my honors classroom. From now on, you will say that a hypothesis is a testable prediction based on observations that describes a cause and effect relationship between variables. And a really good format for a hypothesis is if the IV happens, then the DV will happen. IV referring to the independent variable or the cause, DV referring to the dependent variable or the effect. And we're going to talk about more of those in just a second. So, independent variable. This is what the experimenter is deliberately changing or manipulating in the investigation. It's what you're testing. It is going to go on the x-axis of a graph, and it should be the only thing different between all your different groups. So, for example, if we wanted to do an experiment to see what, if what you drink before a race affects how quickly you run, what would be the independent variable? Pause and think for a second. If you think, okay, what are we changing? We're going to change what they're going to drink. So the type of drink they have is going to be my independent variable. For the dependent variable, we're looking at what changes in response to the independent variable. So we're looking at the y-axis on a graph. It's usually represented by the data we're collecting. So the dependent variable is usually what we're going to be measuring. So think back to that running experiment, the dependent variable would be how quickly they run, so that your time in the race. That would be what we'd measure as an effect. Once you've written a hypothesis, we need to test it in an experiment. And in an experiment, in a lab write-up, we need to write up materials and procedures. So materials are going to be what you're going to need to conduct the experiment. You should include amounts and brands, if that's important and relevant. And you want to be as specific as possible and it should be written as a bulleted list. For procedures, we're gonna write out every step that we take. We wanna start with an action word so that they're very, um, they're given as commands, do this, measure this, count this, that kind of thing. We don't wanna include fluff words. We want this to be very, very specific and succinct as possible. You're gonna include every step so that someone can replicate the experiment and we're going to write this as a numbered list. Now, what's really important is you have to consider a few things when you're writing a procedure. One being experimental groups. These are groups that are being tested. So what is the experimental group in our running example? What are, we what are the groups that are being kind of messed with? That's the people that are drinking something unusual. Maybe Gatorade, um, G Prime, Red Bull, you know, Coke, I don't know, OJ, something funny that they're drinking before the race that we want to see if it messes them up or affects them running. The control group is going to be used for comparison. This is going to be your normal group. So in our running experiment, this would be the people drinking water, which is normal. We want that for a comparison so we can compare the numbers from our experimental group to the control group to see if there's a difference. Everything else should be constant or consistent. So these are the aspects of the experiment that are kept the same, that are held constant or consistent. So in our running experiment, we want all runners to be the same age, gender, breakfast, training, shoes, etc. The only difference we want there to be really is my independent variable. So that if we see some differences in running times when we make those measurements, we can kind of attribute those to the IV instead of any of these other variables. Lastly, you want to always make sure you have as many repeated trials as feasibly possible. This is so that all of our results we can ensure are not just due to chance. It wasn't just something random that happened. We can try to eliminate any errors. We can ensure that our data is precise. That's really, really important. Once we've done the experiment, we're going to analyze our data. and We're going to have results and analysis. Results, you're going to collect data in an organized form, probably in a data table, and then you're usually going to present that data in a graph because graphs are a little bit more visual, a little bit easier to understand than just raw data in a data table. And then you'll have an analysis section where you're going to refer to your data and make statements about what your data shows. You can make inferences as well, but it's just important that you discuss that those are inferences that you're making about the data. This is not where we talk about being right or wrong. Um, that is not something we write about in a lab report. This is also a good place to write any errors. Um, look back and think, what were things that we didn't really hold constant? 
and that could have made maybe messed up or skewed your data. And then, of course, ways to prevent that in the future for someone trying to replicate it. And finally, you're going to draw conclusions, and you're going to communicate those or publish those to others. So you're going to make an explicit, a very clear statement about whether your hypothesis was supported or rejected by your data. Again, we're not being saying right or wrong, but support or reject. So if the data goes with what you predicted, you'd say it supports it. If it doesn't support it, we would reject your prediction. Again, we never are going to say prove or disprove. And then last but not least, we want to state some sort of real-world application. Why is this information useful for someone outside of your science class to know? Um, and write that here in the conclusion. All right, that's your Concept 1 Honors Notes.